Hello, welcome to the second chapter of our course. During this section, we will be looking at the chemistry that forms the foundation for all life. You will be reviewing some key concepts, many of which you are familiar from your earlier studies, as well as relating these to the study of biology. In later videos for this chapter, we will focus on water and the pH scale. But for now, let's not get ahead of ourselves. And instead, we will start by reviewing some important basics that we need to know. So often I get to this chapter and especially considering that it is an early part of an introductory biology course, I get students asking me that I was under impression that I signed up to a biology course, not the one on chemistry. And I totally understand that. And to tackle this question, I am going to do something that I think is always a good place to start. Let's define the terms. And of course, chemistry is the scientific field that focuses on elements and compounds. These are made of atoms, molecules, and ions. So really, everything that we might cover in biology may be an animal, plant, single-celled organism, or even the entire planet. Everything is made of different elements and compounds. And while we are studying these components that make these atoms, molecules, and ions, we will be looking at the fundamental interests of the field of chemistry. Their composition, structure, properties, behavior, and the changes that they undergo during a reaction with other substances. So since all life is made of atoms, It is important for us that if we wish to understand life, we must understand the very basics of what it is made of. So I think it is a great place to start by looking at the four most common elements that we find in a living organism. And what we see here is, of course, the atomic symbol for each of can we work out what each of these symbols stand for? And I suspect that many of you recognize many, if not all of these. So we have carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. And these really are the four most important in terms of the fact that they are so abundant. In fact, these four make 96% of the human. And you will notice that one out of these, it is carbon, that is especially of focus to us. And it is the basis of all organic chemistry. So let's go through the key terms, okay? Okay, the term that I want to introduce here is matter. So what is matter and how can we define it? Let's do this through looking at this marker that we see here. I think that we can all agree that it is made of matter, right? So what makes matter? Let's explore this. So the first characteristic that we can associate with the marker in question is that it has a mass. And we are going to use the term mass as we want to be accurate here. Remember that weight instead is dependent on gravity. Mass is constant regardless. The second thing that defines this marker is that it also takes up space in this larger universe that we are existing in. 
And this can be easier explained as the marker taking up a certain volume in the universe. And of course, I found this following very entertaining since you have a mass and you occupy space. You, of course, matter to me. I know a little science humor has never gone to waste, right? The other thing that I want to mention here is that we typically discuss matter as being able to take three forms. And let's use water as an example of matter. Solid. So this would be ice in our example. Liquid. So the running water as we often think of it. And of course gas such as water vapor or steam. And quite interestingly, if we think about it, they are all connected on a scale that relates the temperature to this. Within the case of water, solid ice being something that is on the colder end of the spectrum, gases, water vapor at the hot end, and liquid in between. And as a side note, some of the more recent classifications have also started to include the plasmas as fourth form of that matter can think. Think of ionized neon gas as an example inside the neon science. So that was our discussion on the matter. Let's have a look of the concept of an element next. So what is an element? Well, really, the basic definition that starts with keeping in line with the layman's term, that is, elements are these basic materials out of which everything else is made of. So if something is matter, which we have defined just earlier, it has to be made of one or more elements. And what we can see on the right is actually an early attempt from 1869, when Dmitry Mendeleev had listed 66 elements. And this gave rise to the periodic table of elements, which you can see in the bottom. What we notice is that there are much more elements in here than those 66 that Mendeleev had listed. And I think that we have a really good definition of an element. So an element is a substance that cannot be broken down into other substances by normal chemical means. So it really is the most basic level to which we can classify materials, if you wish. If we study this periodic table of elements, which display all of these elements as arranged by the atomic numbers, electron configurations, and their reoccurring chemical properties, we start to note certain things. First, there are 92 naturally occurring chemical elements. And 26 more which can be synthesized in a lab setting, but do not remain in a stable form. So a lot has happened since Mendeleev's times. So what do we see about this periodic table of elements here? Well, we see that the letters in it represent the different elements. And you might wonder where these letters came from, because sometimes they make sense and sometimes it appears initially that they don't. This is because they come from both English and Latin names of the elements. But we will be focusing on the periodic table of elements a little more a little later. For now, as long as you see the connection to the term elements, and what we mean by an element, I am very happy with that.
Remember that we said that an element was a substance that we could not be broken down into other substances by traditional chemical means. But we can use another term, almost a synonym to an element, an atom. So essentially, you might see these being sometimes used interchangeably. But let's define an atom here. An atom is the smallest unit of any normal matter. Doesn't this definition sound very much like that which we gave to an element? And indeed it does. So atoms are simply what elements are made of. But the main reason why I want to talk about atoms this time is their structure. And you can see often diagrams like this. And let's have a look of different things that we can see here. So we are going to have a look of different parts that make up an atom. First, you will see these blue dots on the outer shell of an atom. In this case, we have two of these. And they circle the, around the atom's center, which is known as nucleus. Remember the nucleus from our cell. So something that is very central. Well, these two blue balls in this diagram are electrons. And what we end up finding is that electrons carry a negative charge. Electrons are located on this shell, which I have symbolized by this large line around the entire atom. And there they travel around, circling around the nucleus. You can think of this almost like tiny planets circling around the sun. We also end up noticing two especially important things that the nucleus of the atom has. Protons and neutrons. You will notice that protons carry a positive charge and there are many of those. As many as there was negatively charged electrons. So the charges end up balancing each other out. Interestingly, neutrons have no charge either way, as the name suggests. So there is an example of an atom with various components of its disgust. But I want to pause here to highlight one thing. These drawings that we see, they are only snapshots of one moment in time. In reality, these subatomic particles are constantly moving. But let's look at parts of an atom a little more. We will end up finding that electrons carry a very small mass. Protons and neutrons instead have a large mass. Therefore, when we are calculating an atomic mass, we only include the protons and neutrons to this. And this is known as the mass number of an atom. Interestingly, you can often find this in a periodic table. And you will also find the atomic number, which tells us the number of protons. So see how we are already learning to read the periodic table of elements. And there is going to be another concept that I want to discuss with you. Although the atomic number, which was the number of protons, 
always remains the same, T mass can vary. Remember, the mass was determined from the protons and neutrons. Isotopes are variants of a particular chemical element. They differ in neutron number. However, all isotopes of a given element have the same number of protons. And I have included here on the right, here two examples of the natural helium isotope since we were looking at the helium in the first place. Well, this brings us to the concept of radioisotopes. These are atoms that have excess nuclear energy, making them unstable. As they break down and become more stable, during this process, they release radiation. So my question is, I guess, is radiation useful or dangerous? Well, you might have seen these being used as tracers in medical imaging. This tracer then travels with the blood to the area with, where a lot of blood flow occurs, which is an indication of a high amount of metabolism at that location. And this is exactly how we have been able to locate certain functions to specific sites of the brain, for example. Another use where we sometimes see radiation being used is dating the organ, organ material based on it. But of course, we have also a risk of nuclear accidents. And these have some pretty devastating consequences, as have the nuclear bombs. Let's talk a little bit more about periodic table of elements. We already made a reference to it and concluded that it listed all 118 elements. And what is very important is that it lists these in a specific order. Rows are known as atom periods and columns as atom groups. This is important because this way of organizing the elements into this table tells us more about their chemical and physical characteristics. And this is important then because we are now using this table and able to predict how an element will behave. This depends greatly on the electrons on the atom's outermost shell, but we will discuss this a little bit more later on. And this one is just for fun, but it highlights a point that is that each different field then views this table differently as they have different interests. Molecules are electrically neutral groups of two or more atoms held together by chemical bonds. The key characteristic which distinguishes them from ions, which we will look at a little later, is that they lack an electrical charge. And this is where we will wrap up this video now. In the next video, we will take this basic knowledge that we have learned about atoms and their parts and look at this and especially the electrons as a reason to why atoms end up making various different kinds of bonds with other atoms. Thank you for your company on this video.